Good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name's uh, Greg Anderson. I'm uh, the specialist in ancient Greek history in this department, and with John Brook, the co-chair of this year's and next year's programs on um, the state uh, for the CHR. Anyway, uh, today we have uh, a very illustrious, another illustrious visitor, Mark Bevere. He is the uh, professor of political science and director uh, at the Centre for British Studies at Cal Berkeley. Uh, he was educated back in Britain, at his homeland, uh, with a BA from Exeter, a PhD from Oxford, and worked across boundaries there already uh, uh, in the areas of politics, philosophy, and history. Uh, before arriving at Berkeley, he taught at the University of Madras, uh, very interestingly, and at Newcastle University, uh, my old stomping ground. Um, uh, are we in the lat, as we say? His main interests are in political theory, philosophy, public policy and organization, philosophy of history, and the history of uh, British socialism. And his publications are nothing if not prolific. Uh, ten books as author or co-author in the last 14 years, by my count. Um, and 12 books in addition as editor or co-editor. And over 150 articles. I would say of those publications, for our purposes, with our program, the most notable would be uh, 2010, The State as Cultural Practice, which was indeed the publication which uh, made me think of inviting Mark in the first place as one of our visitors. And then also in the same year, Democratic Governance, published by Princeton Press. And this year, the book that's actually on the table right there, A Theory of Governance, and I'm sure some of that material will be uh, filtering its way into our discussions today. Just so we're all clear, the format is we had a pre-circulated paper, and Mark will assume you've at least looked at it. Um, the title of that is A New Governance, Hierarchies, Markets and Networks, circa 1979 to 2010. Uh, Mark will then say a few words about uh, the paper and the general subject area. Chris Otter, our own Chris Otter, will then respond and uh, Mark will presumably respond to Chris, and then we'll have a general discussion. Anyway, thanks very much for coming, Mark. Lovely to have you. Great, thank you very much for inviting me. It's very nice to be here. Um, yes, so I, on the assumption that you've read the paper, I thought what I'd do in my time is provide some context to the paper and maybe give a couple of illustrations to make it a bit more colourful than it is in places, or at least a bit more concrete than it is in places. Um, the, the context gives me a chance to give a plug for this book, because the paper is, or at least the first half of the paper, is taken directly from a chapter in this book. Um, and the context really would try to say something about that, and into that fact. Do you know, I think this book, in theory, should be available free online, but I haven't found out where. Uh, I think something like eScholarship.org slash UC slash Gaia, G-A-I-A, should work. And it struck me, thinking about that, because it's only just come out, but I should find out where, and I should put a link on my page, so if you look at a week and I haven't done so, send me an email and say you're meant to find that book and put a free link to it on, on your web page. So that's the deal in the agreement to publish it. Um, so I'm trying to think about the context and of the book and also the, the more general program you have on, on states here. And it seems to me that governance as it's arisen, and it has arisen massively and hugely in a very short time as a topic of academic discussion, really covers two apparently quite discrete areas of study, one of which I cover in the first half of the book and the other in the second. And one area it covers is that it acts as a very general theoretical concept in which to think about patterns of order and social coordination generally. So you can talk about not just the state, you can think about the state as a form of governance, but you can also talk about corporate governance, so that the, the, the corporation represents some sort of pattern of organisation as well. Or you can talk about clinical governance, how do we get patterns of coordination and organisation in hospitals. Um, so uh, um, uh, that very abstract level, the concept of governance provides primarily social theorists and philosophers with a way of thinking about general issues in social theory about organisation, coordination, and how human activity coalesces into stable patterns of rule, of which the state would be one example, but only one example. So one aspiration, I think, of the theory of government should be to provide something like a general philosophical account of social organisation. Yeah. 
generally. And the, mo the most prominent example in the literature and governance is probably inspired by neoclassical economics. So it's an attempt to explain how and when markets arise, firms arise as stable patterns, how and when transaction costs means that firms are willing to establish more stable links so that you get networks between firms to explain why states arrive all on the assumptions that govern neoclassical economics and rational choice theory. I don't like that theory, so one aspiration I have is to provide an alternative unifying theory of social organisation. And then a second aspect uh, where the, the second area in which governance is used is less to describe the state and other forms of organisation in general theoretical terms, and more as an explicit way of discussing alleged changes in the state since the 1970s. That's probably the more common usage. Um, certainly the one most people are more likely to come across. So it's often, governance is often associated in that language with a contrast within government that is with government that's temporal. As though there's been a shift from a, the state as government to the state as governance. And in most accounts of, of governance in, as a new world, let's call this not a theory but a new world, the argument goes, and I think there's some truth in this argument, that there's been a shift away from bureaucratic hierarchies towards a greater use of markets and networks as forms of public action and public organisation. So the paper you've got is obviously in my attempt to discuss the new governance understood as a new world. But underlying the book as a whole is an attempt to offer a new theory that also, when applied, can make sense of that shift. So what I'm actually trying to do is unify the idea of governance as theory with governance as empirical story and the change of the state, and say, here's a theory, just like rational choice theorists do. I mean, they do the same thing. They try to have this an account of all the organisations, and then they use theories like bureau shaping, you don't need to know what that is, to try and explain shifts in the nature of the state in the public sector. So what I'm trying to do is offer an alternative underlying theory, and use that theory to... to explain and narrate changes in the world in which I've grown up and with my adult life. Um, and my story, and I, I should, perhaps I should say a bit about the theory, very quickly then, because it's not in the paper, my theory is an interpretive theory which is broadly speaking historicist and humanist, perhaps a better way around humanist and historicist. So I think we explain actions by appealing to the intentionality of the actors. It doesn't have to be an intentionality of which they were conscious. We explain that intentionality by reconstructing it as a web of beliefs or a, a whole, a, a, lang, a, a discourse language, whatever you want to say. So some sort of larger whole. And then we make sense of why people ascribe to the web of beliefs they did through by locating them in a historical context that refers to the tradition against the background in which they came to hold those beliefs. So my unifying theory is resolutely humanist and resolutely historicist. And it's important that in both of those respects, it contrasts with the two theories that I think inspired modern, the new governance, i.e. rational choice theory and something like institutions, um, which I think are formalist in a way that means they neglect agency and they're emphatically not historicist in the modes of explanation. So I'm offering an alternative to those theories. So that's the theoretical background that isn't really in the paper. And then turning to the story that I build on the background of that humanist and historicist approach, what I want to argue is that there was a change in the way in which we know the world from a broadly speaking historicist form of knowing to a broadly speaking formalist way of knowing that occurred roughly from 1870, 1880 through to 1920, 1930. It will be one that's very important, but it's by no means the only thing that explains that change. And that saw the rise of the, the modern social sciences in departments and other such things. Initially, I think that social science was housed within the familiar bureaucratic welfare state. So that provided the area in which you found both economic forms of social science and sociological forms of social science, both neoclassical economics and institutionalist sociology. But then I think in the 1970s there was a crisis in the state, and I think that this was narrated in different ways by firstly modernist economists and secondly by modernist sociologists, and I think the ways they narrated that crisis and the ways in the, the policies they advocated in response are then what have driven the attempts to remake 
the state so that it's less bureaucratic and more based on markets and networks. That hopefully was all clear from the first part of the paper. And I thought I'd give a couple of quick examples of that because one of the things I'm aware of, or one of the things I believe is, that it's not really, I think it's quite clear there are synergies. So I think it's quite the most obvious one because people tend to like this one, particularly if they're vaguely left like me, is there's an obvious synergy between neoclassical economics and neoliberalism. Um, and neoliberal policies, which makes it quite easy to think that maybe one caused the other. But I think if you really want to say that the ideas are doing the explanatory work, you need not just to show that there are similarities in conceptual content, but also try to show how the ideas came to exercise this impact. So I think you need to be able to trace something like the, con the, the temporal as well as the conceptual connections by which these ideas came to have this impact. And I think you can do so through policy papers, through think tanks and through individuals. So I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Um, the first example is principal agent theory, which starts off as a theory of corporate governance, but then gets applied to the public sector as a way of uh, explaining why you need things like performance related pay. So principal agent theory says that when a principal, whether that lets in corporate governance literature, that's the principal is the shareholder, when a principal delegates activities to an agent in corporate governance, that's the manager, there's a danger that the agent will pursue the agent's own interests rather than those of the principal. So you need some way of dealing with this. Neoclassical economists' favourite way of dealing with this is to introduce market-like incentives that will make the, give the agents, or will move the agent's incentives to bring them into line with those of the principal. So for instance, performance-related pay is a way of making it so that the agent has an interest in maximising, say, the profits of the company rather than lavish, spending the money on lavish corporate jets. Okay? And the new public management, when it came into the public sector as a way of introducing market mechanisms, one of the things it included was a strong leaning towards performance-related pay, which was inspired, in my view, in part by something like the application of principal agent theory to the public sector. And the most concrete example of that, apart from just telling that as a general story, even more concretely, there was an American social scientist called Alan Shack. Alan Shack worked somewhere in Virginia, I'm always inclined to forget where, and I've forgotten again. I think it was George Washington University, but don't take my word for that. And he was one of the first public administration scholars to apply principal agent theory, which had developed in corporate, in corporate governance, to the study of public administration. And Alan Schack was also then employed by the New Zealand government to write a white paper on public sector reform. That white paper became the plank for New Zealand's public sector reforms. New Zealand public sector reforms are normally seen as being the first attempt to introduce something that looks like the new public management. So you can actually trace the, 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 the ideas through Alan Schack as ideas that arise in, in the corporate governance literature, get applied to the public sector, and then are developed in white papers and then inspire public policies. The second wave of reforms in my account, which you've read, is the sociological one. And there too, I think you can talk about similar, find similar concrete connections. So one main example would be the idea of wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems which, amongst other characteristics, are such that to solve one, you typically have to solve several. So you might say that you think your problem is inner city crime. And you find most of the crime is caused by kids who are playing truant from schools. Then you find most of the truants are actually from I don't know, single parent homes. So what starts off looking like it's a crime pro problem, crime and order, then becomes an education problem, then becomes something like a social welfare slash provision of childcare problem, right? So you, it's not clear how you can solve one without dealing with the others. And the concept of wicked problems first appears in progressive planning literature in the 1970s in an article by Rickle and Baylor. Um, and it first appears in policy documents in Australia in a policy paper, the title of which is Wicked Problems, colon, a whole of government agenda. And as far as I know, that's also the first time that the, either the phrase whole of government or joined up governance appears in a policy paper. So the first time that the idea of whole of government or joined up agendas, which are now everywhere, uh, appears in, a, in the policy documents is explicitly linked to a, a formal social science theory, very wicked problems. 
You can also trace these sorts of things through individuals. So there was a guy called Perry Six, the surname is literally the number six, he changed it by D poll in Britain. A guy called Perry Six, who for a while was an honorary research fellow at Strathclyde, where he ran conferences such as one on the new institutionalism, colon, the neo-Durkheimian approach. At the same time, he was writing policy documents for the, of the British left-wing think tank Demos, with the title Holistic Governance. Um, and when New Labour was elected, they got him to draft their white paper on public sector reform called Modernising Governance. So you can see the link from the new institutionalism through ideas of holistic governance, hold of government, joined up governance, into a policy document which is then driving um, policy reforms. Instead, he did that, he was at Strathclyde with someone called Jerry Stoker. Jerry Stoker co-authored some of the authors for Demos, and Jerry Stoker then became the main academic advisor to New Labour on local government. So you can trace the, the abstract ideas that I outline in the paper. You can trace the more concrete avenues by which they come to be driven into public policy through fairly concrete things. Then, I, although that I think is a, a genealogy of what we might think of as the policies, I'm deeply sceptical of the idea that policies work as intended. Uh, I see that as an anti I don't think this is a bit unfair on Foucault himself, but in honour of how I think he's been misused by a lot of his followers, I see that as an anti-Foucauldian point. And one of the ways I put it is that to show that a bunch of policy documents call a new subject into being is not to show that that new subject actually appears. Right? There's a dreadful tendency amongst Foucauldians to act as though it does. Right? So you actually need to go out and do the empirical work to show that people really did respond in the way that the policy document was calling upon them to do. And in my view, they virtually never do. So then the second half of the paper tracks all sorts of local resistances to these policy intentions from very senior civil servants right down to citizens. I think perhaps my preferred example, because it shows how resistance can happen even with many grey suits, as it were, um, is the senior civil servant, where you might not even have picked up that this was resistance, but we're, we've interviewed, this was done with a collaborator, the whole interview, but not a bit in this paper. We interviewed um, the senior civil British servant, and it was at the time when New Labour was introducing its reforms, which were all about joined up governance at the time. And this was a department secretary, so the highest position you could get in the British civil service, basically, apart from being cabinet secretary. And he was in, in charge of defence. And he said it was a great, he said, joined up, when we asked him about joined up governance, he said, great idea, we've been doing it in defence forever. So if you're New Labour, you have this flagship reform, which you think means we need really drastic changes, and your senior civil servant is saying, great idea, but I don't need to do anything about it whatsoever. Which is also, I have to say, a very British form of resistance. <laughs> <laughs> British civil servants are brought up in a Whiggish tradition, so they think of constitutional change and political change as inherently evolutionary. So when the political masters are coming in and saying, we need dramatic change, their natural reaction is, yes, of course you do. That just involves small little incremental changes along the lines of things we've already been doing. <laughs> so at the very top, the change is being stymied, right, by, by a form of resistance there. But I track other forms of resistance. I vaguely thought I'd draw out some lessons. I'm a bit loath to do this, because part of what I really want to say is that therefore it's a fantasy to talk about governance as being something like a hollow state or leading to meta-governance and that actually what you get is a massive variety of forms of governance precisely because even though virtually everywhere policymakers pay lip service and even at times sincerely try to promote markets and networks, it never works out in that way. So you actually get a massive diversity of practices in my view. But if I were to draw out some general lessons from my primarily British but also sometimes Australian, sometimes American and a bit of knowledge about other areas, um, particularly continental Europe, if I were to draw out general lessons from my studies of those areas, from overall patterns of governance, they would be threefold. One, bureaucracy still exists and indeed is still the dominant form of public action and public organisation. Secondly, markets are resisted virtually everywhere. No one likes them. And thirdly, community reforms are neglected. Because although people might quite like the idea, they never think they're important enough to actually put effort into it on the ground. Um, and then I, wonder, I would stress that all of that is not what public administration figure scholars sometimes call an implementation gap. This is going to be my final point, I think. Um, it's not what they think of as an implementation gap, because the threat, this now will take me back to the idea that I'm trying to 
have a new theory underlying this, which is historicist and humanist. And the idea of an implementation gap seeks to offer a formal account of what I'm calling resistance, which really says there's always a gap between policy and problems which we need to sort out and we can deal with through some sort of further modernist thing. Whereas what I'm trying to suggest, and I do this, I don't really do enough of this in the paper, but I think it's implicit in the theory and comes out in the book. What I'm trying to point to is something more like a fallacy of expertise, where what I want to say is these formalist, modernist forms of social science seek to be able to tell us, introduce a reform of the type X and you will get these results. Introduce markets and they're bound to work in this way, as neoclassical economists might say. Um, introduce deficit funding. And that will help you avoid the disasters of the crisis, as, well as, as people kept saying in America. Or as I grew up with in Britain under Thatcher, there is no alternative. Social science shows this is the only thing you can do. I've, I don't really mind deficit funding, I have to say. But I would like people like Bush and Thatcher and everyone to stand up and apologise for having spent 10 years telling me there was no alternative, only now to tell me there's no alternative, but it's an entirely different thing that we have to do from that which I had to do before. So I'm not really pointing to an implementation gap, I'm pointing to what I think of as a fantasy of expertise, where social science seems to purport to be able to give us sure guidelines that if you introduce this policy it will have that consequence. Whereas I think precisely because public action and public organisation and social life is always inherently contingent and contested and made up of concrete human activity, you can never have that kind of knowledge. So it's not, it's, I'm not trying to just point to an implementation gap. I'm trying to say that the whole modernist paradigm, which has governed developments of social policy and public policy throughout much of the 20th century, is flawed. And then what I want to do that doesn't come out in the paper at all is use that argument to promote more participatory and dialogic modes of policy making as an alternative to modernist agendas. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to make um, uh, some very brief comments uh, now, um, mainly just to sort of some historical and historian, so I'm going to give some historical comments, uh, unsurprisingly. Uh, in, in Mark's book, he, he argues that these, these three kind of modalities of governments, hierarchies, markets, and networks um, have always, well, not have always, but have certainly in the, in the relatively recent past, over the previous few centuries, existed in some kind of relation. It's not just that markets have appeared from nowhere or that networks have appeared from nowhere. And um, I just sort of want to give a little kind of genealogy here. British historians of the states have, have generally produced a, 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 a sort of series of state regimes or models of state regimes which have superseded one another but kind of overlapped. So we've got the sort of fiscal military paradigm of the, of the 18th century which sees that the states role as, uh, as largely um, taxing his subjects for, for the purposes of warfare. And here, you know, the role of the market is fairly marginalized, and the role of the network is fairly marginalized. This is fairly hierarchical. This is then kind of superseded by something often referred to as the, as the laissez-faire state, running from the early 19th century to around 1930. Uh, the the laissez-faire state being uh, a state, as you can probably guess, uh, which involved a greater role for markets. Um, this was then superseded by a social or welfare state, which totally overlaps with it. It's really you know, emerging in the later 19th century, but really comes into its own uh, after 1945 uh, and lasts until uh, until Thatcher appears uh, on the scene. Um, in, in, I don't want to do one of my graphs with, with Margaret Thatcher on, as I was doing in class the other day. Um, with, uh, that would be in poor taste. Uh, this, is, this is a state where the um, this is a situation where the state is assuming a greater role. Markets are perhaps uh, assuming a, a slightly less central role in this. Then we have the neoliberal state where the um, the hierarchies are rolled back and, and markets come into their own again. Now I think that it's important to note with these ideal states that these overlap. There is there is no sharp. This is very British. There is no sharp rupture marking the end of one regime and the beginning of another regime. It's also important to note there's, there's not a, it's not a kind of zero-sum system. It's not, it's not the case that just because markets are doing more that therefore the state must necessarily do less. If you look at the sort of 1870s in, in Britain when, when market ideology, if you want to be desperately anachronistic, is, is in its heyday, 
there's a Victorian heyday, the state is growing in, in all kinds of different ways. So we, we can have markets assuming a greater relative importance, but the state is still absolutely growing in terms of personnel, in terms of roles, and so on. Uh, so um, one can see this relationship in, in numerous historical ways. Neoliberalism has obviously not destroyed the welfare state, uh, which still exists in Britain, although it's been obviously recalibrated and, and marketized to a certain extent. So the idea uh, of, of breaks is a little strong. There's a series of sort of overlapping regimes where the role of markets, networks, and hierarchies becomes sort of recalibrated. Uh, as Mark points out, neoliberalism, though, does mark a, a fairly, I think, probably a more abrupt shift than we might have seen in previous, uh, in previous shifts. Um, it's, it's very ideologically driven uh, under Thatcher with marketization. And it's equally ideologically driven under Blair, although the ideology was simple just because it was, you know, it was kind of touchy feeling blurry. It didn't have quite the same abruptness to it that, that Thatcher's models did. And, and as Mark points out, the, the consequence of this marketization and networkization of government is an incredibly complicated patchwork of, of interlaced have agencies and structures that are responsible in some way for for governing. Uh, another couple of dimensions of the neoliberal um, moment is, is, first of all, it's extremely global. It, that's not to say that previous regimes did not have a global international dimension. Obviously, the fiscal military state does. Uh, the laissez-faire state is to do with it. It's connected and deeply implicated in the formation of global markets in, in many things. But there is a, a very sort of pronounced global rupture going on here with things like structural uh, adjustment and so forth. So this is something that affects the world almost synchronously in a way that perhaps previous changes in, in Western governmental styles have not. Uh, it's topologically uh, novel as well in that there is a, a strong technological dimension to the way these, these networks work. It's no coincidence that we get the rise of marketization again and networkization straight after the microelectronics revolution of the early 70s, which enables information to travel extremely quickly, uh, which, which means that one has the novel patterns of governance that have a new kind of technological uh, form. It means, if we can go back to Timothy Mitchell in our original uh, talk, that the gap, that the boundary between the state and the non-state is, is so blurred as to make a kind, of, a kind of ontological judgment as to where that boundary is seems utterly pointless and, and indeed not necessarily the correct question uh, to ask. In terms of the business of historicism and developmentalism, I, I think I find all these regimes have a certain developmentalism built into them. The, the tell us and direction of history under a, uh, a laissez-faire state was, was of Kind of endless growth. There was a different model under the social welfare uh, state, but then under neoliberalism, we get the same thing again, which is the, the re-emergence of this idea of, of endless growth. Um, and the neoliberal turn, then, I think, does recast economic developmentalism in a rather more aggressive and global way. Um, and just by way of conclusion, if one sort of situates this turn in the 1970s, um, alongside a particular uh, wicked problem that, it, that it's facing and is perhaps dialectically connected with, um, neoliberalism and the global environmental crisis appear uh, at pretty much exactly the same historical uh, moment. In, in other words, um, the idea that there is, uh, we can have unlimited, aggressive growth that can be promoted almost anywhere through markets emerges at the precise time when the the possibility of that is is being um, discussed more openly than ever before uh, in terms of the material limits to growth. Uh, global neoliberal development relies upon fossil fuels, it relies upon water, it relies upon a, a very, it generally does seem to rely upon the development of the Western diet, which itself has all kinds of environmental consequences. These things are finite and, and different, depleting. Uh, and climate is changing. This is not a new problem. In in the 19th century, the, the laissez-faire state faced the problem of peak coal, it faced problems of, uh, of Malthusianism, but it generally thought these things could be delayed and put off. 
Um, but the combination of all these things together is something called uh, the ultimate sort of wicked problem, the, the environmental uh, crisis. I think you can situate this with, with neoliberalism and, and, and ask the questions, you know, are markets and networks the best way to govern this? Are they in some ways responsible for crisis? What is the, the relationship between them? I'm just thinking about how perhaps different regimes produce their own problems and are implicated in them in complicated ways. Do we need a strong state? I mean, this, was, this is, of course, something environmentalists often say, is that you know, we need to have a strong state, but the record of the state's record of regulating its environment is, is often very patchy. Look at sort of Stalin's Russia, for example. Uh, that, that's often seen as one of the most environmentally destructive regimes in history, and it wasn't governing its environment through networks, or certainly the networks were fairly marginal. Um, so anyway, these are just a few thoughts on, on the history of this and some of the, sort of the, the ways in which we might use this type of thinking to think about contemporary problems. Um, but I'm sure there's lots of other things people want to ask. So. Thank you so much, Chris. Do you want to go around the room and get people to introduce themselves? We could. Sure. This, this Maybe if, uh, you probably want to respond, yeah, say sure. a few words in response to Chris. But let's, sure, let's go around the room uh, just introducing ourselves. And, uh, Hi, I'm Greg Anderson again. And who you, you are? I'm Adrian Brasky. Uh, you're in the history department? No, political science. Political science. Okay. Uh, ben, political science. Eric Gilbert, political science. Hacking, seeing it times. <laughs> John Brown, uh, Kevin. Josh Wood, history. Uh, Mike Martocio, I'm a CHR fellow in history. Uh, Sarah Paxton, history and law. Joe Harris, history. Tim Leach, history. Uh, Beth Ann Schlicky Leach, I'm at the John Glenn School of Public Affairs. Uh, Max Blackrack, I was in history. Still am. <laughs> John Burke, history. Oh, uh, Alex Roberts, uh, Public Affairs. Go ahead, go front and back either way. Jan Baxter, that's my Science Department. Emily Lamb, Political Science. Ella Julius Strauss, CHR Fellow. Diane King, CHR Fellow. Cameron Zarkar, uh, Mary Stern, Language and Cultures. Isaac Weiler, Comparative Studies. Maybe I'll call in also Comparative Studies. And I'm Tina Sessa, also History. Well, I suppose I said philosophy, maybe I won't bother with the first comment. Or maybe I'll keep it short. Um, so I think it's helpful to, to distinguish thinking about, I can't remember what you call them, Chris, but the, mod, what, the models of different uh, what were regimes. They, regimes were, well, this was not terrible. But I, uh, when, when you're thinking about those sorts of ideas, I think it's helpful to distinguish what, what you might call aggregate concepts and ideal types, particularly for the social scientists. Um, um, part of what I'm committed to is the idea that there's only really concrete activity. And concrete activity gives rise to patterns, which we might call things like a practice, hence the book that you said was why I was invited to status, the status cultural practice. I want to emphasize that the patterns that arise out of concrete activity are meaningful, contingent, contestable practices, rather than reified structures or institutions. And therefore, that they don't in any sense structure that practice. Instead, they just emerge out of the concrete activities, practices. So that's roughly how I see the, the social world. And in that concept, things like appeals to regimes, I think, can serve various <coughs> different purposes. One thing they can do, which I'm very, and I'll say what I think is right about each of these purposes, and if where I think it goes wrong. So one thing they might be is they might be aggregate descriptive concepts. And I think that's how they're normally used in British history. So what, what the, the concepts there are really saying is, most of what we see fits this pattern at this time, right? And that's all it's saying, it's just an aggregate descriptive, it's a descriptive concept that describes a general pattern in the data, to put it in language that social scientists of all stripes might be happy with. Historians would just say, it's a pattern we see, right? Um, another thing that these concepts might be is aggregate explanatory concepts. Now, as a historicist, I'm okay with that, as long as they're understood as traditions. But not if they're understood as structures or institutions that somehow replicate themselves. So they have to be described as an intellectual tradition that people inherit and are capable of modifying. Right? 
And at that point, they could be explanatory. So we might refer to the neoliberal tradition to explain why Hayek gets the ideas he does. Or we might refer to a British Whiggish tradition to explain why my <coughs> senior civil servant responded in the way he did to join up government. So certain aggregate concepts, provided they're suitably historic, historicist in nature, I think do explanatory framework. But they must be historicist in nature, not formal. So then if these concepts are formal, and they, they in that sense seek to bestride time and place in defining patterns, right, or in providing explanations, then I would rather call them not aggregate concepts, but ideal types, which is how I think most sociologists would think about them. I don't think ideal types have any explanatory value whatsoever. That follows from what I said earlier about the idea that I think it's just concrete activity which gives rise to practices understood as emergent things rather than the concrete activity instead of being structured by some sort of reified structure. So I, don't, I think it's, it's a mistake to imagine that ideal types have that explanatory power. I don't think they do in most of these British cases. But I'm willing to accept that ideal types can have, I don't think they really have descriptive value either in any straightforward way, but I do think they can often act as useful heuristics. But that to say something's a heuristic uh, and that it's useful to think with is not the same as saying that it's an aggregate description or it's an aggregate explanation. And in many ways, particularly when I've been critical of the kind of sociological strand of modernist social science, what, I'm, what you could describe my criticism as ideal types are treated not as heuristics, but as having either explanatory or descriptive adequacy, which I don't think they do. They're not explanatory because they don't allow for contingency or historicity, and they're not adequately descriptive because they don't allow for agency and contestability. So I think it's useful to think of those levels of different ways of thinking in the abstract concepts. Then turning to more general notions about neoliberalism. I could to say, to say what I'm going to say as we should be able that we have a, a choice between either say, saying, either adopting, in my opinion, other people might not think this, but in my opinion, a rather unhelpfully broad concept of neoliberalism, or saying we don't live in a neoliberal world. And I'm going to go for the latter, just because that's actually what I think. I, I like a narrower concept of neoliberalism where it's intimately tied to a faith in markets. And I just don't think we live in a neoliberal world. And I can offer various reasons why so many people keep banging on neoliberalism. But I'm going to stress that I don't think we live in a neoliberal world. We don't live in a neo neoliberal world because we've had what I in the paper called the analytic second wave of reforms. Virtually no policymaker you talk to anywhere in the world today thinks markets are undeniably efficient. On the contrary, most policymakers today are now concerned with sorting out the problems they think arise about markets. They're interested in state building in places like Afghanistan, building institutions as the necessary content <coughs> for markets to work. So far, the total opposite of the neoliberal agenda, which was to do away with traditional institutions and introduce markets in their place, most policymakers today are obsessed with building into what they see as the institutional and network prerequisites for successful market activity. So the poly, and you can see that in international policy, where there's been the shift from the Washington consensus to the post-Washington consensus. You can see it in development policy, which is now entirely about state building or about whole of government approaches, much more than it is about encouraging states to introduce. It's about governance, under, understood as institution building, which is how tends to get used in the development world. It's about building institutional capacity, which is often understood in network terms, in countries, rather than simply encouraging them to engage in free trade or to wither away the state through market policies. So neoliberalism is dead. It just doesn't exist as a serious policy agenda anywhere anymore. And yet we still talk about it the whole time. I think there are two interesting experiments. We, the alternative would just be to expand the notion of neoliberalism to the point where it includes things that seem to be overtly hostile to Hayekian principles or any other major neoliberal principles and are all about Fukuyama-like state building. And if we really want to expand neoliberalism so vastly, I guess we can, but I think it's better to have a narrower concept and say we just don't live in a neoliberal world anymore. Or at least we live in a world in which no serious, virtually no policy makers are driven by neoliberalism. I think there are two reasons why we still tend to go on 
on. Well, why academics tend to go on and on about neoliberalism and Freud, do they? And the first is that, and I mean particularly left wing academics, speaking as a left wing academic. And the first is that if you try to tell the sort of story I tell, most vaguely left wing social scientists are fairly happy with the idea that a bad, nasty, neoliberal series of forms, of forms of power knowledge that valorise markets and is tied to neoclassical economics and um, rational choice theory, tried to take over the world under Thatcher and Reagan. That's not actually a particularly controversial story to tell. When, they get, when it gets much more controversial is when I try to say yes, and that was followed by a second wave of reforms in which institutionalist social science tried to promote networks. And at that point, a lot of left-wing social scientists want to say, but that, that institution, that, that's just plain good social science. <laughs> and they don't want that to be treated as a form of knowledge in the same way. So they're quite happy to run the first mode of critique against neoliberalism, but they don't want to run the second critique against institutionalism because that's what they practice and it's just good, straight, instu straight, um, straight good social science. As, as one, one person did actually use that phrase in just said, but that's just simply good social science. And then, um, so, so that's one reason. Then the other reason, which is more about the Foucauldian left, particularly in America, and perhaps also British governmentality literatures, which is why I'm always so, this is why I'm always so reluctant to sign on to that, or use that language, is that I grew up in a world of Marxist study groups in which we were told that capitalists were going to spread markets and take over the world. And no, the neoliberals said, we are capitalists and we're spreading Marxists and taking over the world. So all my juvenile left-wing fantasies were fulfilled. At last, the enemy were out in the open and telling me this was what they were doing. And so greatly were my left-wing fantasies fulfilled that I am now, and I don't mean me now, I mean people of my generation, that I'm now blinded to the fact that the world has moved beyond that. Right. So I think there are very good historical kind of structural reasons why academics find it really hard to let go of the idea, particularly left-wing academics, let go of the idea that we live in a neoliberal world and, and constantly come back to that phrase. And I wish I had, I don't, I wish I had a good catchy phrase for what I think we do live in. But it isn't neoliberalism. It's a world in which the poli po policy agenda, any way you look, is dominated by partnerships, joining up, Perhaps behavioural economics and nudge technologies, um, it's a, or, and then by attempts to spread networks, it's a, attempts to build institutional capacity, it's an ability to, to build social capacity, an attempt to promote democratic legitimacy, all of which is entirely not neoliberal. But those, if you read any policy document, that's what they're now on now. Right? Anywhere outside straightforward economic Right, and even large bits of economic policy now read like revised forms of Keynesianism. So we just don't live in a neoliberal world, not in my opinion. Um, and then finally, one very quick comment on do we need a strong state. I, I mean, part of what I'm trying to do is to get away from the very idea of the state, I suppose. So in, in the state is cultural practice, and a bit in this book, I talk about the state of the state. And it's not really that I, it's not that I don't think the state exists, it's that precisely as I don't think you have, I just think that concrete activity gives rise to practices understood as emergent properties of that activity. So I think that the, there is no essence to the state, such that it's bound to generate certain consequences or do certain things. And I think that's always been true. So I think the states, the, 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 the boundary between state action and voluntary sector action and private action has always been highly porous. It might look more so now, but I think it's always been like that. So to some extent, I think the discussion of strong states or weak states is a bit meaningless. We might talk, if we wanted, about a state able to get its will, right, to, to achieve its policy intentions. But precisely because I put so much emphasis on resistance, I think that's always been the myth. I don't think states have ever been able to realise what they want in any meaningful way. Policies have always failed. States have never got what they actually intended out of things. It's always generated further unintended consequences and problems, etc., that we're dealing with. So even now, I'm not quite sure what the strong state would actually mean as a good thing. So then I think what we're talking about is things like the size of the states measured in various terms or how many activities are taken on by what we might call central state agencies or the core executive.
rather than other sorts of agencies. My own personal preference, partly because I just have inherited a lefty dislike of the state, I'm a particular sort of lefty, um, partly because I think of the, the state has just been home to this fantasy of expertise for so long. My own strong preference, uh, my own preference there is for a highly pluralistic, loosely organised state. But in a way, that's a, for me, that's of secondary importance. The real moral of what I'm trying to say, I think, is not that we need to think in those terms about the formal organisation of the state, whether we want a strong, a, a more bureaucratic state or a more loosely pluralistic state. It's that what we really want is a shift in the mode of knowledge that dominates policy. And we want to get away from modernist modes of knowledge and introduce more humanist and historicist and dialogic modes of knowledge. Whether or not that saves the environmental crisis is an entirely different <laughs> story, to which I probably think no and nothing will. But yes. my wife has banned me from saying that because I'm not allowed to depress the kids. <laughs> I'm not allowed to say it. No and nothing will. Julia? I'm, I'm a little surprised to hear you say that you don't live in a neoliberal world because as a student, as a scholar of British politics, um, neoliberal um, modalities have been so important into the government at every level of decision making, particularly in the kinds of things that you think of as um, public-private partnerships and connections with communities and multiple nodes of decision making. There is, I think, good reason that the critics of this look at this and say this is this is nonsense. These are these are not you, they, uh, 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 a justification of, uh, of market efficiency and competition is used to break up the NHS, to privatize and to sell off the railway network uh, and so forth and so on. And yet um, none of these promises have been realized. And yet, even so, the, the last thing to go has been the Nobel Mail. Um, and the next thing is going to be the NHS. Um, and it seems that there is a very, very good set of power reasons uh, for this that have to do with international capital. Uh, with crudely the argument being, although people won't admit this publicly, that the reason that all of these activities that are funded by the state need to be taken off books uh, is basically so that uh, the, the British state can show uh, how lean and mean it is and how it, it isn't operating deficit spending to international markets. And this kind of argument about international capital is used to justify all kinds of indefensible uh, things as far as social contract goes. So I'm, I'm surprised to hear uh, a one. The reason I don't use the word power is that I think so many people, despite Foucault talking about power as his concept of power as lacking a centre, so many people fall back on the idea that power must have a centre so that it must, in effect, to evoke power for many social scientists is just to evoke something like the structuring effect of a series of institutions like capitalism, to which I don't think exists. So I tell, I, although I think the paper is saturated with a Foucauldian like notion of power, I don't use the word because I think the notion of that the concept of power as used by Foucault actually has what Wittgenstein would call a bewitching effect, where it encourages people to read into it a centering and a structuring effect which Foucault explicitly disavowed. Um, so that's power. And then on the neoliberal thing, I mean, I guess that illustrates, I think your, your comment, Julia, really illustrates what I was trying to say. So if you want to define neoliberalism very broadly, to cover all the things you referred to, then obviously we still live in neoliberalism. But that makes neoliberalism synonymous with everything that breaks up the state I grew up in. If you want to be, have a narrower definition of neoliberalism, which I do, and I will say more about it in a moment, then I think you need distinctions you weren't making. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, neoliberalism is rooted in a faith in the efficiency of markets. What that means is that in the public sector, it was principally about privatization, because that took things away from the state and handed them over to market forces where they were bound to be efficient, or contracting out, because contracting out was how you introduce quasi-market-like situations within those areas of the public sector which could not be made, so could not be privatised. So the original neoliberal agenda of public sector reform, there was also the new public management which was primarily about 
partly performance related pay, which I discussed earlier, but also a series of budgetary techniques related to trying to introduce market like measures. So the original neoliberal agenda for public sector reform was about privatisation, contracting out, and new public management. Um, and the justification for that was the argument that markets were inherently efficient. So you introduce markets or mechanisms or contexts that look as close to markets as you get, and you necessarily get greater efficiency. Right? That was the justification. Now, quite a lot of the things you're talking about and that I would see as the second wave of reforms just don't fit that. So you started with public-private partnerships, they don't fit that. That's, that's, not, that's not contracting out, that's not privatisation, that's not the new public management. In some forms it is, in some forms it leans towards contracting out, but often it doesn't. Often it's a way of raising capital for public sector projects which are then leased back, but it's primarily a way of raising capital. Joined up governance is manifestly not about contracting out privatisation of the public management. When New Labour eventually loses faith, which it does in the joined up governance agenda, it does not emphatically go back to contracting out privatisation. Firstly, its first response is to introduce evidence based policy making. So the idea is that instead of having a blanket faith that certain things will work, you will, roll, you will roll out a policy in a small little experimental area first, then you will find evidence of whether it's working. If it is, you will roll it out in other areas. It was based on practices in, clinic, in clinical medicine, is was where the idea first arose. Um, and then when it starts to give up ideas on that as well, it turns again, not to contracting out of privatisation to what I think is very helpfully called by, I think it's Christopher Hood, targets and terror. So what happens is targets are introduced, and if the public sector agencies fail to meet those targets, then they're subject to all kinds of penalties, which is no market mechanisms there at all. It's targets and terror, traditional bureaucratic tools, really. Right? So under New Labour, what you get, and it actually starts under John Major, is not, and therefore the Conservatives, is not neoliberalism understood as contracting privatisation or the new public management. Instead, it's something different, which is what I'm arguing is justified by institutionalist types of social science, which are partnerships, networks, joining up, and then more latterly targets and terror. Right? Um, and not only do you therefore get a very different agen reform agenda from that of the original neoliberals, but the justification ceases to be markets are inherently efficient and becomes precisely the language you used which is now, in this world today, not in all times and all places, markets are inherently efficient, but now, in this times, in these new times, which originally, as I'll say in the lunchtime seminar, is originally a Marxism today phrase, that then bleaches into the Labour Party under Neil Kinnock, when it's been advised by Eric Hobsbawm, and gets really heavily picked up by Blair, who is advised by Demos, which is headed by, I'm blanking on the name, but you can look it up, but it was a guy who taught in the geography department at Newcastle, um, and who used to write for Marxism today, and becomes, Morgan, thank you, and becomes the, the main policy advisor at number 10 Downing Street. You can also find Demos think tank work has been employed by Gordon Brown as his main policy advisor. Interestingly, as there are so many historians in the room, um, Gareth Stedman Jones' son goes and works for Demos and also then becomes briefly an advisor to the new Labour governments before doing a PhD somewhere in America. So there's all this links between new Marxism today into Demos into new Labour, and the language stops being markets are inherently efficient, and it becomes, we live in new times, those new times are encouraged by flowing international capital. In those contexts, the state needs to be faster, more mobile, it needs to respond to international agendas, but the way it does so is not straightforwardly through markets, it's through networks joining up, public-private partnerships, targets and terror, etc. So you can call both of those things, the original neoliberal, if you want, you can call original neoliberalism, which was all about contracting out privatisation and new public management, and was justified by a language of markets are always and inherently efficient. You can call that and everything that supersedes it neoliberalism. But you lose really important conceptual distinctions if you do. Conceptual distinctions that run through from the intellectual justification, which shifts from being the inherent efficiency of markets as taught by neoclassical economics, to being a sociological argument about the new times in which we live. From that, through also to very distinct policies, which shift from contracting out privatisation of the new public management, which are virtually unheard of now, to building capacity, networks, um, 
stronger legitimacy to give the state greater capacity to act, um, joining up, etc., etc. And, and that, to me, the two just look so radically different that I actually think it's better to call them different things rather than to assimilate them all under what I think of as an overly broad concept of neoliberal. But if you if you want to call the latter neoliberal, then of course we still live in a neoliberal world. Yes. Um, I wanted to go back to one of the observations that Chris made that I thought was, was very interesting and see if you would like to speak to it a little bit more, was the uh, coincidence of the global, econo uh, global environmental crisis with this uh, neoliberal turn. And um, you, did, you did mention that your wife doesn't let you talk about how pessimistic you are. But whether you see any particular forms of governance as leading to a more optimistic outcome or um, anything else you would care to say on those lines? Um, I'm not sure I think there's much connection between the environmental crisis and the right of neoliberalism. Yeah. I think that the right, I think there are things one needs to look at before what I'm talking about, noticeably patterns of funding in America that create a, a, a world that crosses think tanks, to, to a lesser extent also in Britain, think tanks and academia, which is actively seeking to promote what later becomes neoliberalism. So an agenda in which choice is linked to decision theory, which gives rise to things like rational choice theory and makes neoclassical economics a wider intellectual paradigm, all of which goes on right through the progressive era. So there are precursors to what I'm about to say about where the intellectual agenda comes from. But I think the rise of neoliberalism from a minority intellectual interest in the Mount Perlin society to a global policy agenda is really driven by the fact that the narrative it's already starting to develop provides a compelling account for and via, apparently viable solutions to three problems which there starts to be fairly common agreement that we face in the 1970s, which are inflation, state overload, and a persisting underclass. Personally, I don't think we did face the latter two problems. I think there was inflation. Um, but I think there was widespread agreement that there was, and I think the neoliberals had a compelling story for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I think that's really where it came from. Um, you could argue that all of that was connected with the oil crisis, particularly inflation, and that that was something to do with environment. But otherwise, I'm not sure there's much of a connection. Um, I think that, I think there is limited, I'm very pessimistic on the environment. I think there's limited reason to think that environmental sources are treated with greater care if their care is handed over to a community of users of those resources. I don't, because I don't believe ideal types have structure and properties, I can't say that's bound to happen. Right? But I think there are limited reasons to think that's true. I therefore think there are limited reasons to think that extending certain forms of collaborative governance, and the problem with that word is it's become so ambiguous now, but some forms of collaborative governance, by which I really mean collective self-governance of local groups, could provide a way of limiting some environmental problems, but by no means all and probably not the most important. And I think that probably there is no viable, I can't, I find it really hard to see a viable. I, the, pro, the problem is that unless, that maybe you do need a strong state. I mean, you can, you can imagine a totally totalitarian, there are three, it seems to me that, sorry, I'm going on and on. So it seems to me there are three possible ways of thinking about it. One, you need a really, really strong totalitarian state, which will just forbid us from hurting the environment. I don't see there's any hope whatsoever of us creating a global state of that sort. At the other end of the spectrum, I think you could imagine a change in human consciousness such that we all suddenly really start to mind about the environment and not about what we do. And I'm thinking there of all my colleagues who talk about how awful all those Californians who drive SUVs are, 
Um, when a lot of the Californians who drive SUVs then use them in the summer to go up to the Sierras for their annual holiday, while my colleagues who bemoan them complain about SUV drivers fly off to their second home in Paris <laughs> two or three times a year and, and, and consume resources in a way that dwarfs what the SUV users are using. Right? And I think the chances that we're all suddenly going to change our human nature and suddenly start to not consume resources in that way, I also think, no way. Right? But maybe that's another utopian vision. So some sort of decentralized, changing human consciousness will do it, but I don't think so. There's a middle way which I, my oldest academic friend in the world, called James Medicroft, who started as a, a doing his PhD when I did as a political theorist for me, but now works on environmental politics. He's, he believes in this. And maybe he likes to think that you could get the rise of the environmental state almost accidentally in the way that the welfare state arose. So you could get various policies being introduced in various locations, and then they sort of seem a good idea, and then they spread to other places until eventually you have something like an environmental state. I guess of my three options, that to me looks the most viable, but I'm deeply, deeply sceptical. I just don't think that the environmental state can can get the same sorts of political support as it rises in that way that the welfare state did. So, but maybe. Uh, let me ask a question which was percolating while I was reading your paper thinking, why am I not seeing this? Why am I not seeing this? Why am I not seeing this? And why do you think about this? And then you, then you sort of answered my question. Well, let's please do on. I mean, what my question was, was I do a lot of reading. Battling Hamas and my big legitimacy question. I didn't see anything about legitimacy. Right. Yeah. Suddenly we have legitimacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I heard you talk about yeah, yeah. logic. I talked to you yeah. talk about participatory. Yeah. And you to use the word yeah. itself yeah. twice. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I'll spit it out. Yeah. So how, this is, how does legitimacy play into your analysis? Okay. I assumed if I had that book, I'd yeah, my hands on the index. Else. So, so you got chapter seven. Yeah. Cha chapter eight, what could you call the geniality of governments. Chapter eight is governments after the neoliberalism, which I've just talked about. Uh, yeah. uh, Judah. Chapter nine is system and radical perspectives, which is really what I'm going to talk about now. And chapter 10 is democratic innovations, which is the nearest I get to trying to suggest an alternative. Um, so I, I think one of the trends well, I first of all, let me ask you this. Did the hierarchical and market states, did they abandon uh, forms of governance? Did they abandon concerns about legitimacy? And if so, why? Uh, how no, did, they how did not. They, they, they emphatically did not. Okay. Um, I think that they were, I mean, part of the problem is, I don't think they worked as intended. <laughs> so I don't think I can really say this is how it worked out, mm -hmm. right? But I think if you look at their theoretical agenda, both of them, although I think this is slightly more obvious with the market one, were deeply and profoundly anti-democratic. Mm -hmm. in, in the market case, the reason was that the rational choice literature in particular suggested that collective decisions, even when individuals acted, if individuals acted rationally, it could lead to collective irrationalities. And there were all sorts of formal models showing that. So that you've got certain pathologies built into democracies, such as increased, ever-increasing public spending. Um, and as a result, rational choice theorists argued that what you needed was what they called non-majoritarian institutions, but are better described straightforwardly as undemocratic institutions, i.e. Right. institutions that are not controlled democratically. Right. Uh, and the most key example was central banks, because they could control the money supply and therefore stop inflation um, against a, a public which even if it collected, acted in, as individuals, everyone acted rationally, would collectively constantly increase public spending and therefore inflation. And the first reform New Labour does when it's elected is, introduce a, 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 is to, to, to turn what was a democratically controlled Bank of England mm -hmm. into a, a non-majoritarian institution. Um, so I think that's where it's most obvious. But they weren't concerned, they definitely would not have thought of themselves as moving away from legitimacy. Instead, I think they would have insisted on the importance of markets as a way of exercising choice alongside um, things like voting. And indeed, on the superiority of markets as a way of aggregating choices because people could express more nuanced preferences. Mm -hmm. So they would have seen markets as having greater legitimacy. 
democracy for, for in, in many areas than traditional democratic structures. Um, so they, I don't think they abandoned legitimacy, but I think they were anti-democratic. Then I think that this, my second wave of reforms, I, don't, I think their problem was that for many of them, they were responding to a world they thought already existed, which was this world of networks. For others, they thought they also wanted to promote networks. And I think the problem there is that in my view, they wouldn't all share this, but I'm going to put this in hostile terms. Some of them will put it in much more global terms. But what they then did was, in my opinion, networks necessarily weaken accountability. Because if you have a strong hierarchy, the lines of accountability are clear. Whereas the more you move to networks, the more accountability lines get very, very blurred. And it's not clear who's, account who's accountable for what to who. Right? So I think that to advocate networks rather than hierarchies is necessarily to weaken an important democratic value, particularly if we're talking about legitimacy, which is clear lines of accountability. Most sociological theorists, I think, will probably agree with me, but they don't like to put it like that because they want to advocate networks. So instead what they do is talk about the need to rethink accountability. And they do that in various ways. Some of them talk about network accountability, but the main way they do it is to do what they call a shift from procedural accountability to performance accountability. So instead of there being the formal procedural accountability within a hierarchy, what you now get is that people, through their voting, mm -hmm. vote on the performance of governments or agencies, thereby ascribing account, thereby showing that they regard the institution as legitimate. Right? And I think that, too, is an anti-democratic move. I think procedural accountability, not performance accountability, is a really important democratic value that is there being lost. Mm -hmm. So I think both are anti-democratic, but the advocates of those approaches will not agree with me. Um, and then, one, and this is, this is really the, ch the chapter after the after neoliberalism in the book, one of the things that then happens, and, and I don't go into details about the paper at all, we're absolutely right, is that governments and policymakers themselves, particularly after they start to stress performance accountability, get very concerned about their lack of legitimacy because of the lack of citizens showing that they regard them as accountable, which can just be, for instance, low voter turnout. Mm -hmm. And declining voter turnout seems then to be a decline in legitimacy. Right? And this is happening at the same time that this social science language of the new institutionists is suggesting that legitimacy and therefore trust, which is meant to be the key property of networks, legitimacy and trust are integral to organizational effectiveness and efficiency. So a lot of people are saying, oh look, we as political institutions, policy makers, say the EU, we're suffering from a lack of legitimacy, which is shown by our, our lack of declining voter turnout. And we know that that lack of legitimacy is going to affect our effectiveness and efficiency. So the lack of, so the need to build legitimacy, uh, and in that sense, democratic, some sort of democratic credibility, becomes a, a major means to building efficiency and effectiveness. So what you get is a raft of policy agendas and programs which, seek, which have, adopt my language, if you like, the language of promoting democratic reforms, but do so in order to create greater efficiency and effectiveness, rather. So they are, in that sense, yet another modernist agenda, rather than a genuine attempt to promote dialogue or participation. And the chat, relevant chapter in the book tries to track that process, particularly through a couple of EU white papers, to show how it transforms democratic ideals from what I call a radical agenda to what I call a system agenda, because the idea becomes that these reforms will serve the system, and as a result, participation drifts towards things like incorporation, and dialogue drifts towards consultation rather than genuine dialogue. That's what I'm trying to do in precisely that chapter. Okay. Well, that's what I agree. It's not in the book. It's not in this paper at all. Uh, so I'm wondering, sort of the, just think about the different sites and the different places where what kind of political action are happening. You mentioned corporations, the academy, think tanks. And what strikes me that's missing in this is um, NGOs. Uh, and, and that this is a critical that the, the explosion of NGOs happens in one of these critical terms, right? I and mean, it happens in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and that also brings up the issue of, of large-scale social movements, right? 
Um, the model we have right now is, is top-down conversations happening where you sort of can track, right? One person talking to the next person, talking to the next person, you know, uh, who's friends with this person who has a PhD from here. Um, resistance, and, and then them sort of consolidating it and thinking resistance at the bottom level, but then if we have large-scale social movements, maybe it's, it's moving the other way, right? Is this not a way for what you said, the sort of participatory actions, right? And, and that this being the kind of goal and the strive for, for what we want to get to, um, how that's factoring in, because at least from, you know, in, in terms of the social science literature, in IR, for instance, uh, network theory is directly coming out of the human rights agenda. And it's sort of, in the 90s, people starting to look and see of non-state actors mobilizing things at the international level, and completely changing the, you know, the way in which we understand sort of atomized actors in IR. Um, that's coming directly out of one of these sort of social movements. Um, so how does that factor into this? Um, yeah, N NGOs explode. Um, some of them, but not many, explode during what I would call the neoliberal phase. Um, but by and large, those are actually private organisations that appear, not so much non-governmental organisations. Although non-governmental organisations do also play a role, if insofar as the state can have, they, they win contracts. Um, and, and one of the one of the really bizarre things that happens in neoliberalism is that the state says it's going to privatise an activity or it's going to hand it over through a process of contracting out. The state bureaucrats who used to run the, uh, the, the agency form a new independent company, put in a bid, win the contract and now run the thing, sometimes as a non-profit. Right? Mm -hmm. So the same people are doing exactly the same thing, but now it's called an NGO or a private sector organisation rather than being part of the state. Um, and then when they really take off is with the rise of networks, um, particularly in international relations, where, where they become, the agencies that already exist, like Oxfam, become key agents in the attempt to build whole of government agendas for dealing with famine, disaster relief, etc., etc. The, but also, there are also private sector organisations that get involved, and particularly in things like security. So then you get in international security, you get the massive rise of private security agencies doing things that before would have been done by either UN officials or things. And that, I did, so I've been doing some work for the UN recently, actually, and, and I went to get my security pass in Geneva. And this woman was in front of me in the queue, and she had a pass, I so I looked at her and said, you've already got one, of those. why do you need to be in the queue? And she said, it, it, uh, it's running out. So I said, okay, how often do, I, how often do UN staffers need to renew them? And she said, UN staffers are a dying breed. And, and now, increasingly, the UN contracts, I doesn't contract me, interestingly, because I have a secondary appointment at a United Nations University, so I count as a staffer. But increasingly, it contracts out policy advice work to NGO-like think tank people on specific issues. Um, so I agree that NGOs are important. However, part of what I was saying to John about the democratic thing is that on my, in my account, they, what's actually going on is, generally speaking, something that's better described as co-optation or consultation rather than anything like a genuine partnership or an actual promotement of, of dialogue. Um, Resistance, I, I've come to, I, I'm, alas, despite being self-critical here, I think I remain utterly wedded to the term, but I'm going to explain why. I come out of really British Marxist debates, and it, I come out of a, a kind of tradition that goes through Raymond Williams and E.P. Thompson through Stuart Hall. And in that, in, that, in that tradition, what elsewhere might be described as discourses or narratives is typically seen as ideologies, um, and then what goes on against that is resistance, perhaps by subalterns. Um, so resistance is almost universally seen as something that then is a good thing and that goes on primarily at the bottom of the chain by subaltern-like actors, where, of course, my theoretical account, and this is why I, get, I specifically gave you the account of the senior civil servant, is one in which everyone's resisting everyone, and it's not meant to privilege the subaltern in quite that way. Um, then on large-scale social movements, I mean, I think that they can obviously create the pressure for change. I just don't think they often do. And moreover, I think they, as much as anyone else, are subject to something like regimes of power knowledge. So the kind of issues of social science I'm talking about. But then I also have 
I, I, I get way outside my area of expertise in what I'm about to say, so I'm not going to defend particularly the latter. Mm. I have two objections to large-scale social movements, and I'm speaking now purely as someone who would like to promote what I think of as loosely left-wing causes. I might even end up with three objections. One objection is that I am incredibly sceptical the idea that social movements themselves bring about change rather than going through the need to go through something like political parties to gain control of something like the state. I'm just deeply, deeply sceptical of that and always have been. I'm especially sceptical of it in America, where I think it's an easy opt-out, particularly for academics who want to seem to be on the side of the angels on every single dis dispute. And if all they need to be is on the side of this social movement now, that social movement now, they can always do that. Where as soon as they need to come up with something like a unifying program, they will have to decide which angel they're siding with on a range of issues in a way that will stop them being able to play the careerist game of being a professional critical theorist, which is very common in American academia. So they won't come out with that kind of hard choices. Um, so, which reinforces my scepticism of putting your faith in social movements. Those two I'm quite happy to try and defend. The third one I'm less happy because it's a second-hand argument that I take from somebody who actually is an Americanist, who I'm willing to believe tells me that part of the problem here is a misreading of American history, in which a lot of people are over put overemphasis on the role of courts in the success of the civil rights movement and ignore the importance of political action within the Democratic Party and also the social movement. And so that what you have in America is a range of individual social movements who think they're going to win through the courts. And I think that is so naive it's not true. So although I'm obviously quite keen on social movements, I mean, I was saying earlier, my own preferences for a heavily decentralized form of the state, I, I think that there are two there's an, the idea that the courts are going to help, the failure to confront difficult problems about how you're going to render the agendas of different social movements compatible with each other, and the general neglect of what you might think of as the reality of the state and its role in public policy making. And remember I said I still think the main forms of public organisation and action are bureaucratic. I think it's so naive um, and so obviously loaded with the careerist advantages that come from being a professional critical theorist that I'm just deeply sceptical of attempts to introduce them here as though they offer some sort of panacea. Eric? Another question about, you used the word modernist. Yeah. It's really two questions. One is a small question, one is a larger question. The small question is, you talk about modernist forms of knowledge, something that emerges in the 20th century and the late 19th century, maybe. And if I was going to periodize when modernist forms of knowledge arise, I would go you know, two centuries back from there, at least. Um, that's a small question. The, the larger question is, um, the, the word modernist, the phrase modernist forms of science or modernist forms of knowledge plays a kind of explanatory role in your own analysis of where we get in the other where we get the new, um, the new theology, the institutional. And that seems to me, when you're trying to account for the existence of people who reject your own humanist and historicist uh, premises, you appeal to exactly the kind of discourse regime, right? Um, and kind of reify this course regime that you seem to want to go out using your humanist and historicist frame. So I'm, I'm just curious, how do you account for the emergence of these forms of knowledge without appealing to the term modernist or modernist, right? And then right. how do you justify the use of that term to refer to the Okay. Um, so I think there are actually three questions there. Um, <laughs> so, I think modern is an ambiguous term, most obviously. Yeah. One area where you get modern is when you move from medieval to modern. Another way you get modern is when you move from early modern to modern modern, or however you want to periodize those. But I'm calling modernist, and I mean it, and, and uh, I mean the analogy to be with things like modernist architecture or modernist art. Mm -hmm. So I, and I, the way I characterize modernism is in those terms. So it's about the rejection of narrative or historical forms of explanation and narratives in favour of these formal ones. So I guess what that would commit me to, which I do believe, would be the idea that the 19th century is not characterised by formal explanations, and instead it's characterised by narrativistic historical explanations. And I would just point very, very loose order um, to 
John Stuart Mill, Hegel, Comte, Spencer, all of them had historical narratives and they located particulars within those narratives to make sense of them rather than by and large. Opinion. So Marx would be a big exception to No, Marx would be the same. Great historical narrative in effect. Um, there's an internal logic to capitalism on my reading of Marx, but I don't think that's... But then capitalism, depending on how you read Marx, is either a necessary successor to feudalism, I don't think that, or a contingent successor to feudalism. But I do think that, but in a way... Itself, yeah, but, and that seems to be... Not, yes, and in a way I'm not necessarily hostile to, because I think you could see it as an account of unintended consequences um, of a certain sort. Um, but I'm not a Marxist, so I'm, I don't need to reconcile my views with Marx, but I think, <laughs> I think it is a narrativistic historical account. Um, and I think that's what dominated 19th century ways of thinking. And I think that's not what dominates 20th century ways of thinking. So all of them have these historical accounts, and they explain particulars through the, those accounts. Moreover, they tend to explain particular, they tend to explain particular institutions by locating them first in the other institutions of the relevant country, and then tracking the historical development of those institutions, and then looking for common, pattern, common historical patterns which they might universalize. Right? And that does. So even in the early 20th century, political scientists like Herman Feiner, um, when he publishes his first book on comparative government, it starts by with a chapter on Britain, and then there's a chapter on Germany, then a chapter on France. Whereas when he publishes his classic textbook, there's a chapter on legislatures, a chapter on executives, which is now what you'd expect in comparative government. So you can actually see in his career the shift from the idea that you'd reconstruct a, a set of government as a whole, and then put that in the context of the history of that country, which still lingers. My first ever course was Introduction to Politics, the one I taught, uh, the first course I ever taught at Oxford. And that, coincides, that taught the Federalist Papers and then American government, um, the Communist Manifesto and Soviet government. So it was this ideas to institutions like a probe still unfolding. But that's been, over the 20th century, that was replaced by the search for correlations between types of legislatures and types of electoral systems, uh, where the correlation has some sort of formal power. Right? So that's, that's what I mean by modernism, is that shift from those kind of histories to that. And I think it's analogous to modernist architecture, etc., etc. Um, then, is, mod is that notion of modernist akin to the kind of reified concepts I would reject? No, I don't think it is. Because I would go back to what I said with my initial comments in response to Chris. I think that's an aggregate historicist concept. So it describes, a his it describes or in a way that I'm about to do in answering what I think is the third question. It describes the contingent rise as a way of thinking as a hist in a, through a, a historical story and then tracks the unfolding way of that thinking through various policy agendas rather than saying, under conditions X, which are purely formal, you will get modernism. When you get modernism, you will get this under equal form of things. So I think it's what I called an aggregate historicist concept rather than what I called an ideal type. Right? And that brings me to how would I explain the rise of modernism, and the very, very simplistic answer is World War One, because uh, the, the historicism of the 19th century was intimately tied to the idea that reason and pro the, the history revealed the unfolding of a rational, pro rational principle in a progressive manner. That's there in weak historiography, it's there in Mill, it's there even in Comte, it's there in Hegel, it's there in Spencer, it was, um, it's there in all popular narratives as well. And World War I just makes that seem stupid. Right? It just makes it seem stupid. So even people who carry on telling historicist stories after that, and that goes right up to today, for those of you who work on British-like stuff, think of Stephen Collini. Right? The, um, or, or think of it in literature, think of people like Evelyn Moore and Graham Greene and what happens to them. It gets, it lacks conviction and it, it, but it, there's this almost kind of nostalgia for a world in which you can really believe in developmental history, histories and now you can't. Bertrand Russell once said you couldn't really be happy if you were born after 1914. You couldn't know true happiness. And it's that, the, then it's that same thing, this lack of sense of confidence that the world was on your side and it was leading to the 
World War I just made that look stupid. So the simple answer is World War I. But that, of course, begs the question of why didn't they move to something like radical contingent historicist narratives along the Nietzschean line rather than these formal models or formal approaches. And there I think you also need then to appeal to the rise of other ways of thinking that are already in place before World War I. And this will go take you back to school probably. So it's only in the 19th century that you get the rise of things like Bo Boolean algebra, named after Boole, or Venn diagrams, named after Venn. And those mathematical techniques make possible what later become rational choice theory. They actually make it possible to extend logic and deductive logic from the traditional syllogism to things like set theory. Right? And that opens up a whole new mode of analyzing things. Likewise, there are massive advantage of developments in statistics in the 19th century, which open up what becomes behaviorism. And you can see that going on before World War I in people like Jevons, who's one of the founders of real hardcore neoclassical economics, economics, not the soft stuff peddled by Alfred Marshall, who starts as a statistician. And that's where he starts. And then he applies a mixture of statistics and algebra to utility theory to develop a marginal utility theory of value and thus the basis for what becomes the British equivalent of Austrian economics. And that school of neoliberal economics really has two different origins. One is in the British approach coming out of Jevons and the other is in the Austrian approach. And there's strong debate amongst the historian of economics as to which arises first. But they really arise at the same time premised on the same mathematical advantages. So what we've actually got is the development of these techniques and incipient ideas around them going on throughout the 19th century. Then World War I creates a crisis of faith in this other way of thinking. There's a long process in which people like Evelyn Waugh, T.S. Eliot, carry on telling or being loosely attached to developmental history-like approaches but with nostalgia. While other people like Graham Wallace start to champion the new approaches um, as responses to World War I, what it shows. I mean, Wallace is quite explicit, that's what he's doing, which then feeds into American political science, many of whom are trained at the time, either Britain or Germany. Um, and so, and that's not what we've come to know, but it's based on these earlier mathematical techniques as an alternative approach. And that's then what wins. And, and I, because, because I'm a historicist, it's contingent, it with us. Of course, it could have been Nietzsche, and everything could have been Nietzsche. But there just wasn't much, Nietzsche wasn't read much. The fact that the war was against Germany discredited all German philosophy, including Nietzsche. Um, then he's associated with fascism, which makes him even harder to read. If I asked you, and I would be hard put to do this, how many other people can you think of in, in, in the late 19th and early 20th century, other than Nietzsche, who are historicists and reject all developmentalism? I can't really think of any. Even historicists who were writing about the crisis of historicism, so think they're historicists but reject developmentalism because they think that leads to philosophical problems. People like Croce, therefore beyond him Gramsci, or Trotschka or Meinecke, they're all actually continuing to affirm broadly developmental print views of historicism without faith in it, sometimes explicitly needing to appeal to something like God to hold up that faith, but it's all uh, Collingwood in Britain, similar, right? There's all the loosely spiritual presence that makes it work, rather than the complete, the more radical, more nihilistic approach of Nietzsche. And then I think, and, and I think this would be true even for someone like me today. There's also a problem if you ha if we had all gone down the radical historicist agenda, of just the difficulties of seeing how that's going to lead to a policy agenda that you can sell to people as responding to concrete problems, rather than just being a, a philosophical response to philosophical difficulties. Right? And the amounts of times I can run through what I've run through today uh, in front of what I think of as positivist social scientists, and they will go, broadly speaking, yes, 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 which I don't think is because they agree, I think because it's easy to push me aside by just saying yes, yes, yes. And then at the end say, but we've got to have policies, and we've got to have knowledge that can inform policies, and that means we've got to have the sort of knowledge we're producing, doesn't it? Right? And the alternative, which is what I come up with, has to be something like, it's all likely to fail, but nonetheless I suggest you try these things because they might be a bit less likely to fail. And that's a much harder set as a policy agenda. Right? Much harder. Thank you, then. Just quickly. Um, I know that we're, we're running out of time, but um, 
but you, you mentioned there sort of thinking about thinkers who were not progressivists in the, in the 19th century, and you mentioned, well, I think there are, there are two trains of thought which are potentially not progressivist. They're all historicists, though, and they're all temporal. Mm -hmm. so, so one train of thought comes within political economy itself, uh, and is Malthus. Yeah. Um, and Jevons himself, yeah. who of course is is the great calculator of peak coal in in the um, in the nineteenth century, and who is who basically says in two thousand years it's over. You know, there's no way we can possibly yeah. um, our economy can our economy will cease to grow. And so there are these people who are critiquing growth not on intellectual or philosophical grounds, but on resource grounds. And it's interesting that Jevons does that as well as the statistical yeah. stuff. Yeah. And I do think there are, there are also um, degeneration theorists, uh, many of whom are Darwinians. Uh, you know, I think Darwin is a thinker who's, of course, completely historicist. Everything, everything yeah. is historical, yet he's not a progressivist. And yet yeah. evolution yeah. is totally read as yeah. being progressive yes. at all times. Yes. I, think so, that's, I think the reception of Darwin, I totally agree with right. Darwin. And I think it almost illustrates, because I also agree with the other things you're saying, but it illustrates the overwhelming strength of the progressivist. That he's universally read, even by hardcore Darwinians like mm. Huxley and Tyndale, oh, yeah. tend to read him as a, a treat him as right. a progressivist. Well, he becomes, he, he becomes, I mean, he kind of was a Lamarckian half the time yeah. anyway, but he really became Lamarckianized immediately yeah. through the idea of orthogenesis and so on. So I think sort of 19th century, you've got everything is historical, everything is situated in, in some historical frame. And the progressivists are predominant, but there is there are these kind of yeah. generations yeah. of pessimists around yeah. the outside. Yeah, I, I think that's loosely right. I, I I I think one thing I think so I it's I think talking about the Enlightenment is difficult because I think it's it, the Enlightenment was never a straightforward thing, and it gets followed very very quickly by something that is also quite enlightenment, which is a form of romanticism, which is organicist. But there's certainly a strand within enlightenment thinking, which is very mechanistic, right? right? Um, and I think someone like Malthus often is drawing on that. Mm. And what you have is something that actually, in many ways, isn't historicist. It's, it's more a sense that there's a divine law underlying this, or, and it appeals much more to something like a, a, a natural theology. Right. Right. Um, so the kind of divine laws, natural theology, mechanistic right. tropes. And I think those persist in the early 19th century, right. but have almost vanished by the late but By the end of the 19th century, century there, are, there are plenty of... The neo malthusianism reappears every, yeah. every year. Yeah. And, and it, it, it's progressively less linked yes. to anything divine. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So I, th I, I think there's a, that, that kind of approach, the kind of div, uh, natural theology approach, is heavily present in the early 19th century, but largely disappears as right. the 19th century goes on. Um, what then arises as alternative to the progressive one, I think there are two. One is the kind of declinism that you're talking right. about, which sometimes is the idea of that there's just finite resources and we're going to go through them. Um, but, can, but can also just be a more tragic narrative. But the other thing that persists, because particularly in Britain, I don't know about other European countries, but it's far less common in America, but particularly in Britain where Oxford and Cambridge are still providing almost exclusive education in the classics, there's also a, a, a continuing sense that things are historical, but history should be understood cyclically. So for instance, what you get in, in writings on the empire, you see this a lot, that there are always empires, but they always do. And, uh, and some people are saying that will inevitably be the fate of the British Empire because that's what Rome teaches us. We read your given, you know. And, uh, there are people who put it that simply. And other people say, oh no, the British Empire is unique and different for these reasons, and it can escape that process. So there are his there are historically inflected modes of inquiry that are not straightforward and progressive, undoubtedly. But it's I think the overall thing is progressive. The, the allowed uh, um, entropy, thermodynamic theory. Um, which is which is an Anglo-German development in the mid nineteenth century. That is the most pessimistic theory of all. That it, he death in any sense of British invention. But this, so, uh, this uh, partly is why I think that I dislike the way in which people talk about the Enlightenment without either 
indicating that it includes romanticism or say that the Enlightenment doesn't last very long. Because I think that the, the classic, rather naive image of the Enlightenment has been highly mechanistic, highly about natural theology and uh, everything being modeled on Newtonian science. If that's going to be your very restrictive view of the Enlightenment, then I don't think it lasts very long, because I think it's very quickly replaced by what in, we would most commonly call romanticism, but I think that's a bad word for it because it ends up in two types of literature and the arts, and it's better described as organicism. So you see, originally, almost from the rise of the biological sciences as the key sciences, different developments in theories of the human organs and the heart and things with thinkers like William Lawrence and his theory of the blood. And that feeds into things like early Lamarckian thought, and it overlaps, particularly in Germany, with the rise of natural philosophy and the idea that the whole of nature, as well as man, should be understood as organic and unfolding in a loosely progressive way. Um, which then also, and in Britain, the, the rise of those forms of thinking, and we now know, courtesy of some really great work in the history of political thought over the last 30 years, we now know just how deeply Mill was influenced by Humboldt. Um, so that is reinforced by the triumph of weak historiography over Benthamite utilitarianism. So that virtually all the main ways in which people think become these progressive ways of thinking, either something coming out of German romanticism and idealism and natural philosophy with its roots in a, an organicist term, or out of restatements of weak historiography as the main forms of, of liberalism. I think we should probably call it hard. Well, we'll carry on later. Yes, indeed. Yes. 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 Uh, thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you.